Welcome scholars. This video is a bit of an extension or exploration. This is really to ask, answer Sean Rose's question about weak acids and bases and their pHs. And to be able to understand weak acids and weak bases, we first really need to think about equilibrium. And on its own, in our regular class, if we weren't there for uh, out on quarantine, then we would have been spending a few lessons on equilibrium and doing a lot of interesting stuff with equilibrium. But to understand equilibrium, let's consider a reaction where the W is the coefficient on reactant A, the X is the coefficient on reactant B, and this reaction can go forwards or backwards. So this is a reversible reaction. And then we have products C and D. And when we look at this equilibrium, there's all kinds of things that can affect it. And it's mostly affected by the concentrations of all of these species. Imagine a chemical reaction where all you have are the reactants. If you don't have any products at all, and that reaction is going forward, then the reactants A and B are going to react to make the products C and D. As the reactants A and B react, their concentrations go down, and the amount that this reaction is being pushed forward goes down. As A and B react and C and D are produced, C and D's concentrations start to go up, and so then the reverse reaction starts to happen. So there starts to become a balance here at some point, and it depends, and that balance point is different for every reaction. Some equilibrium are reactant favored, like with weak electrolytes, like weak acids and weak bases, and some equilibrium are product favored, as would be the case with, say, strong acids, which we normally don't even think of as being reversible. But we can actually assign equilibrium constants to some of those reactions with strong acids. So in this equilibrium, the balance point for this equilibrium is going to be called an equilibrium constant. And this equilibrium constant, or K sub EQ, is equal to the concentrations of the products multiplied together divided by the concentrations of the reactants multiplied together. And if there's coefficients on these products and reactants, then those coefficients actually become exponents on those concentrations within this equilibrium expression. Sometimes people use lowercase a, b, c, d here for the coefficients. I think that gets confusing, especially when you're seeing it for the first time, which is why I've used the w, x, y, z. So every equilibrium, every reversible reaction is going to have an equilibrium constant, which depends on these concentrations. If you were doing this for, um, with gases, then you might instead use the partial pressure of C, the partial pressure of D, partial pressure of A, partial pressure of B. And again, these would be raised to the exponents, which are the same as the coefficients in the equilibrium reaction, in the balanced reaction. And then technically, this isn't really equal. If you remember thinking about the gas law, PV equals NRT, there would actually have to be some sort of a constant here to go between pressure and molarity, okay? So they're not perfectly equal to each other. It does depend on temperature if we're trying to convert between pressures and concentrations, which is one reason why we always try and stick with having everything in solution or stick with having everything as gases whenever we're looking at these equilibrium reactions. And in these equilibrium rea reactions, then there's something called 
Le Chatelier's principle. which basically says that uh, systems at equilibrium resist changes. And again, there could be a whole lesson on this, but let's say that this system is at equilibrium, and then all of a sudden I add more A into that system. Well, this system is going to resist that change by reducing the amount of A to make more C and D. But for this system to reduce the amount of A that I've added, it's gonna to have to take away some of the B. But then that system resisted that change of adding all of that A by taking some of that A that I added away and causing it to react. This is gonna come back later when we talk about buffers at the end of this little video. The final comment here really to say is that in these equilibrium constants, we tend to exclude liquids and solids. And what that leads us to then is really an equilibrium with a weak acid. So let's consider acetic acid, which we could write as that, or which we could write as this, either way, that's acetic acid. And let's say that reacts with water. When that reacts with water, we make the hydronium ion, which again, we typically just abbreviate as an H plus because we typically ignore the water there, even though that's technically part of the reaction. And the other product is the C2H3O2 or acetate ion, which we could also write as CH3COO minus. Now notice this is one to one to one to one. So all of our coefficients in our expression would be ones. Our equilibrium expression for this, our KEQ, would be H plus concentration times acetate concentration all over acetic acid concentration and water concentration. And you say, wait a minute, we tend to exclude those from KEQs, you are correct. But the reason why we exclude liquids and solids is because what we're really doing is we're saying this concentration is constant. So we are multiplying both sides by it and that this H2O concentration times KEQ, if the H2O concentration is constant, that gets rolled into this other equilibrium constant called a Ka, where the A stands for acid, and then this is a dis dissociation constant, because the acid is breaking apart, and this Ka equals the H plus times the anion from the acid, which would have been the acetate, all over the original acetic acid. And for something like acetic acid, this Ka happens to be 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. So from looking at the value of that K, does it seem like the concentrations of our products would be very high compared to the concentration of our reactant? Hopefully you said no. Now one of the things you can do here is you can set up some math. And our reaction, I'm just gonna rewrite it again, but I'm not gonna include the water. Our reaction is the acetic acid dissociating into H plus and acetate. And of course, these are aqueous. 
thinking back to our net ionic equations, because this constant is so small, we normally would not think about this as dissociating at all in solution. However, the whole reason behind doing this now is to figure out how much of this is actually in solution. What would the pH be of a 0 0.100 molar solution? What would the pH be of this weak acid in solution by itself? Just this acid in pure water. And so what we set up is we set up something called an ice table. You'll see this in college chemistry. The I stands for initial. And the initial concentration of the acetic acid would be the 0 0.100 molar. And unless this K is extremely small, or unless this concentration is extremely small, rather, then we consider the H plus concentration to be zero. Even though we know there's already some H plus in the water, even though we know that's one times 10 to the negative seventh molar, we'll come back to see how that really affects this or doesn't affect this. And if all of the acetic acid is still together and none of it has dissociated to make H plus, then none of it has dissociated to make the acetate. So initially we show what's in the solution. Now as this dissolves, as this reacts with the water, it's going to undergo a change. How do you think this is going to change? This is going to go down. We don't know how much it goes down by, so let's call that X. So it goes down by X. The H plus goes up by X. And the acetate has to go up by the same amount. If this is one to one, these two changes are linked. They are stoichiometrically uh, equivalent. If this was one to two, then this one would have to be two X. The C stands for change. And these have to follow mole ratios. And then we have E, where E stands for equilibrium or expression. Not this equilibrium expression, but an expression here from our concentrations. We don't know how much this changed by, but we know it goes down. So what could we write here for the concentration of the acetic acid? We could say 0 0.100 minus X. Here we could say 0 plus X, right? Or 1 times 10 to the negative 7th plus X. Or just X and just X. So looking at this table, this is an ice table, and we're going to extend it into an icy table in a second. Looking at this ice table, we now have values that we can plug in for these concentrations. In this expression, we have a value for the H plus concentration. It's a variable, but we can plug this in. We can also plug this in for acetate. So when we plug this in, we have 1.8, times 10 to the negative fifth equals x times x over 0 0.100 minus x. Well, what's going to happen with these two x's on the top? They're going to become x squared. What's going to happen with this denominator? We sure don't like seeing that down there. So we want to actually move this up so it gets out of the denominator, if, especially if we want to group our like terms. So we're gonna end up multiplying both sides by this. So multiply both sides by 0 0.1 minus x. I'm gonna drop the significant figures for here. Just remember they're still there. So now these cancel. I have x squared equals 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth times 0 0.1 minus x. If I distribute that through, then this exponent's gonna go down by one.
and I have x squared, x to the first, and x to the zeroth. So now if I bring all these terms over to the other side, I have x squared plus 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth times x minus 1.8 times 10 to the negative sixth equals zero. And then what does this equation look like? You should be saying a quadratic equation, which means how do we have to solve for the x? We use the quadratic formula. So remember, x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Or you could perhaps plug this into a calculator and use the solver. And when you do this, you get two real roots for x, negative 0 0.001351, or 0, positive 0 0.001333. And my calculator might be rounding, so there might be more to those, but that's what I'm going to stick with because of my original significant figures anyway. At this point, in, chemist, in math class, you might be done. In chemistry, you need to think about which of these makes sense for the expression we were trying to solve for. So yes, we got to this quadratic equation that we could apply the quadratic formula on, but this x is supposed to represent concentrations of chemical species. Notice here that the H plus and the acetate started out as zero, especially the acetate, and that this X is supposed to represent how it changed, and that this is the final concentration and equilibrium of the acetate ion. It would not make sense for us to keep this negative root here and use that in this place, because it does not make sense there is no such physical thing as a negative concentration. And so this positive concentration, this positive root, is the one that our x's are equal to. And so what this really means is that our H plus concentration, if that's what we were after this whole time, our H plus concentration is 0 0.001333. Remember back to the little video on pH. If we take the negative log of that, then we find our pH, and our pH, as given here, would be 2.88, maybe 2.9, depending on how you went around your significant figure. And our pH here would be 2.9. Now, the final E here in the IC table would be the actual equilibrium concentrations. So this H plus would be the 0 0.001333. The acetate would be 0 0.001333. And you'd have to do the subtraction over here for the acetic acid molecule, which would give you zero point zero nine eight six six seven and so you should be able to connect this back to our discussion on electrolytes and ionic equations notice that this equilibrium concentration is not very different at all from what we started out with and so the bulk of this does indeed stay together only a very small amount dissociates and so that's our pH and I looked it up and Reese had responded to Sean and Reese had stated a value of 2.4. And again, this is going to depend on the initial concentration of the acid. So this would be lower if this acid was more concentrated. In fact, I did just run through that and a one molar solution of acetic acid gives a pH of 2.37. which is probably what Reese had seen to get the 2.4.
Now, the other thing you could think about with this is that that, of course, kind of makes sense, right? If you put more acid into a solution, the pH should go down, especially if pH depends on the H plus concentration. The other way we can look at this, the other way we can think about these acids as or bases is instead of just looking at Ka's, which start to get all the at these exponents, which are kind of weird, is we often compare them by looking at a pKa. And the pKa is just like the pH, where the pH is the negative log of the H plus concentration. A pKa is the negative log of the Ka. And in the case of acetic acid, this is four point seven. So I think I may have commented off the top of my head in that one uh, discussion thread that some of those pHs may have been where the buffers were, but it does look at like that one pH at least for the acetic acid of two point four was for a one molar solution. Now where the pKa's come into play, where this 4.7 comes into play, is if you had exactly equal concentrations of the acetic acid and of the acetate ion, then this would act as a buffer system. This would be a very strong equilibrium ex example where you've got a lot of these and a lot of these that are on both sides. And if you add something else into that mix or take it away, then that equilibrium is very balanced and it's able to respond well to that. And so acetic acid, if you had acetic acid and acetate, like say from sodium acetate, and you put two of those into solution and they were exactly equal concentrations rather than being the zero when we start out, the pH of that solution would be 4.7 and that's where it would buffer. Now the more acetic acid and the more acetate you have in solution, the stronger that buffer is going to be, the more easily it's going to keep the pH around 4.7. When we talk about buffers, we typically say that they're good for plus or minus. So a buffer pH is plus or minus one from the um, pKa. And so if this is 4.7 for the acetic acid, then the acetic acid could buffer effectively between pHs of 3.7 and 5.7. And when you look at other systems like carbonate, which is in our blood, or phosphate, which is also in our blood, we see that those pKa's are kind of close to where we want to be for, say, buffering our blood. Let me just put that over here for blood buffers. And some of the things that you might think of in blood, there's phosphoric acid. Um, and that phosphate, remember phosphate is used extensively by the body. Phosphate appears in all of those nucleic acids. Phosphate appears in all of those adenosine triphosphates and diphosphates. And so phosphate's naturally around and it exists or it happens to work as a buffer. And so if you have the dihydrogen phosphate, and that's in equilibrium with mono, only one H mono hydrogen phosphate. The pKa for that acid dissociation is a 7.2. And it's known as pKa2 because phosphoric acid has three H's. So this is the second acid dissociation of phosphoric acid. You might also think carbonate would buffer in your blood and it does have a little bit of a role but at a pH or a pKa of 6.4 for its one system in the presence of CO2, um, it's a little bit lower than this. It's not at the extreme edge of this buffer in the blood, but it's kind of far away if we're thinking about our plus or minus one for the pKa. And the 10.3 would def definitely be too far away for that to work. And that's because the normal pH range for blood is between 7.35 and 7.45. So this is really an ideal system phosphate 
is really an ideal system working as a buffer in our blood. What this means is that there's slightly more monohydrogen phosphate than there is dihydrogen phosphate because this pH range for blood is a little bit higher than the 7.2. So I know this was a lot. Uh, I hope this is not too long of a video, but I hope it shows you some of what you can do, some more of the stuff you can do and think about with weak acids and weak bases. This whole video was made just based off of the acid viewpoint, but just like we talked about hydroxides and pH, you could also work through any of this with a weak base. The key would be that when you do the ice tables, the X that you're solving for is not the H plus concentration, but it would be the hydroxide ion concentration, and you'd still have a, another step or two to get through to get to the pH. Hopefully this also helps you see how you can connect some math in with chemistry, specifically the quadratic formula here. And um, please, if you've got any more questions, feel free to jump into Zoom and ask about this. Again, this is really kind of an extension for this point in the school year. If we were still in the classroom, this would have been a part of the class, but we would have had a lot more time to build up to it. So. Uh, Good luck working on your stoichiometry worksheets. Please also jump into Zoom for help with those. And then that's it for chemistry at Aiken Scholars Academy.